Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Carrie Burke, your moderator for today's webinar, Threat Modeling for IoT Systems. You may send in questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A chat feature. We will collect these and address them at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dan Cornell, a globally recognized application security expert who holds over 15 years of experience architecting, developing, and securing web-based software systems. As Chief Technology Officer and Principal at Denim Group, he leads the technology team to help Fortune 500 companies and government organizations integrate security throughout the development process. Thanks, Gary. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, and today we're going to be talking about threat modeling for IoT systems, which is something that I'm very excited about. Now, threat modeling has always been a, a technique for software assurance that we've found to be very valuable. Uh, and IoT systems are some of the more interesting things that we're looking at uh, these days. And so it's pretty exciting for me to have the opportunity to combine those two things, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, I'm Dan Cornell again, as Carrie said, the founder and CTO of Denim Group. Uh, I'm a software developer by background. I think that is important or relevant to what we'll be talking about today, uh, is that I'm a software developer, originally spent a lot of time in the mid to late 90s <clears throat> doing work with early Java uh, systems on the web, I spent the early 2000s working with some of the earlier ASP.NET releases. But for the last 15 years or so, what I've really focused my time on is working with organizations to understand how the software they develop and deploy for their environments and for their customers, how that software impacts those organizations' risk. And so I'm a software developer that has come into the world of security as opposed to someone who may have a more traditional information security background coming out of a systems administration or network, penetra uh, network penetration testing background. Uh, a little bit of background about Denim Group. Um, and so let's just get started. So uh, just a, an interesting or amusing anecdote, or amusing to me because I wasn't directly involved in it, but uh, uh, just before Christmas this year, my uh, one of my uh, business partners, uh, Sheridan Chambers, who's another principal here, uh, looked out his window and noticed that his neighbors who were out of town, there was someone in uh, on their porch rifling around with some packages that had been shipped for Christmas. And so he goes outside in his uh, pajama pants and a, and a t-shirt and goes to confront this person. And as you can see, uh, when he actually first confronted him, the, uh, the ski mask was pulled fully on the guy's face and he had a knife. It's uh, almost as if you called the Law & Order Special Victims Unit casting people and said, please send over a burglar. Uh, Sheridan decided that maybe he didn't need to be uh, confronting burglars at that time and called the police and the, the, and the man left. But what he found out later was that the neighbor's uh, camera that they had uh, you know, attached to their house had captured all of this. And so they had uh, very nice photos taken of this gentleman as he, uh, you know, as he looked through their packages and, and, uh, and, and spoke with Sheridan. So I thought that was an interesting view uh, or an interesting situation that occurred where we had additional information specifically because of IoT devices, consumer IoT device. From an agenda standpoint, we're first going to talk about IoT, uh, the Internet of Things, and a, a little bit about my perspective on this, uh, on, on this topic or, or on this industry. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll try to disclose or, or, or explain the bias of the, or where my perspective comes from, because my perspective may be different than other folks. Uh, then we're going to switch gears and talk about the goals of threat modeling. Why is threat modeling a valuable practice, and what should you expect to get out of it in your environment? Then we'll combine those and look, why is threat modeling a particularly valuable practice when you are looking at IoT systems? We'll provide a short tutorial or background on the practice of threat modeling. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to go in-depth with that, but I have included at the end of this slide deck links to deeper materials that we've published on the topic. Uh, and uh, then we'll look at something that we found to be particularly interesting in threat modeling for IoT environments. Uh, and part of that will be a discussion of the safety implications of IoT environments, which is something that has been really interesting to explore and forces security professionals to think a little bit differently than they may do in other scenarios. Uh, as Kerry mentioned, um, you know, we'll have time for questions at the end, so please send those along via the Q&A feature. 
So let's go ahead and get started looking at an overview of the Internet of Things. So I mean, one of the things that we've found is, uh, or that, that I believe, uh, is that IoT is really cool. In my role as CTO at Denver Group, I have a lot of discretion in how I spend my time, and so that means I get to do things that I think are fun but also important in the industry. And so I've spent some time looking into IoT just as a number of years ago I looked at uh, a lot of mobile application security issues, uh, you know, early after the release of the iTunes Store and, uh, you know, with, with Android and iOS and, and mobile applications. And IoT is cool because it lets you as an individual, it lets organizations do a lot of really interesting things that they couldn't do before. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about some use cases for network-attached cameras, uh, you know, fitness tracking, personal assistance, and that's to say nothing of other enterprise and, uh, and industrial IoT use cases. Uh, one interesting observation based on this is it seems like if you are an IoT company, there's only about three colors that you can use in your logo. That's weird, but, uh, but fine. And so, but, but IoT is not just consumer IoT. If you look in the press, that is what gets the most notice or the most column inches printed uh, or published, <clears throat> but I think that if we look at the number of deployed IoT systems and if we look at the overall economic impact of IoT on the world, the majority is actually going to come in both industrial applications of IoT as well as enterprise applications of IoT. And so what, what do I mean by those? And so these, these are the definitions that I use for IoT or for different types of IoT, different use cases. Um, and again, if you have thoughts on these, please feel free to share them in, in, in the questions. This is an evolving area, uh, and I would love to hear people's perspectives. So the first thing I look at is consumer IoT, and those are IoT systems that are sold to the general public. Uh, front door cameras, exercise trackers, personal assistance, things of that nature. And again, that's what we see a lot of the mention of in the press. One of the things that we've had the opportunity to experience quite a bit of is, is working with organizations, uh, enterprises that are deploying IoT. And so when I talk about enterprise IoT, what I'm talking about are enterprise organizations uh, deploying IoT systems you know, often consumer-focused devices, but deploying them into enterprise IT environments. And that has led to some really interesting interactions that we've found as these consumer-oriented devices get integrated or as organizations attempt to integrate them into enterprise IT environments that often have a different set of assumptions, a different set of controls, uh, again, a, a very different environment. When I talk about industrial IoT, what I'm talking about there is more specialized IoT systems that are sold into industrial environments. And so smart lighting, hyper-connected control systems, industrial equipment uh, enhancements that uh, you know, make them network and things of that nature. And, and again, the press talks predominantly about consumer-oriented IT, but we've had the opportunity to look at and work in a number of both enterprise and industrial IoT environments. And in a number of ways, I think those are, are, are more interesting from a security and from a risk management standpoint. You know, so why, why would any particular, particular user or class of individuals or organizations be concerned about IoT security? From a consumer standpoint, more savvy or more sophisticated consumers are probably asking the question, I'm using this IoT device. Is that safe and what is the impact on my privacy? From an enterprise and an industry standpoint, the question that we've seen most frequently is I'm deploying IoT devices and IoT systems into my environments. What are the risks? How does that, you know, how does that impact my risk posture? Also, we have the opportunity to work with a number of developers, and their concerns are I'm building this IoT system, now, IoT devices communicating back to services. What do I need to worry about? from a security standpoint. And so everyone, because of their role, is going to bring a little bit of a different perspective on their concerns about IoT security. So I want to talk a little bit about my bias, or the perspective from which I view this, uh, this challenge of IoT security. And because, again, my perspective is probably different than, uh, than a lot of the people on this, uh, on, on this webinar. And that may lead to me reaching different conclusions. And so, obviously, you know, Denim Group as a, as a professional services as a consulting firm, we predominantly help organizations deal with the risks associated with IT, and so that is where my perspective comes from. 
Uh, consumers don't typically pay us because they're too poor. Uh, and I'd say that a little bit in jest, but if you think if, uh, if for, for an average individual user, if you're spending 60 or $80 on a Alexa device, you're probably not going to want to talk to us about a five-figure threat modeling engagement. Uh, yeah, that's just not, <laughs> that budget-wise doesn't make sense for any consumers. But we do work with a number of organizations that sell things to consumers. And they interact with us from a standpoint of, hey, we want to protect our brand. We view security as an important part of our brand, and so we need to make sure that we're properly addressing security with these devices and systems that we're selling. How do we do that? We also work with enterprises to help them be safe when they are deploying IoT and into their enterprise IT infrastructures. And again, enterprises have the budget. And so they're looking at IoT and saying, we perceive that there is value that we can get from deploying these IoT systems, but how does that impact our risk posture? How do we do this safely? Is this even something that we can do? Again, organizations have a tremendous drive to do digital transformation, to innovate for themselves, for their customers, but that needs to be done in the context of the risk that they're also accepting. Uh, similarly, industrial organizations, have the same question. They're saying, we see tremendous value that we can gain by deploying IoT systems in our environment for a variety of different use cases, but how does that impact the risk that we're exposed to? Uh, and again, as I talked about, we work with a number of IoT system builders uh, because their question is, how do we build these things in an appropriately secure manner so that we're handling security and also, you know, in, in addition, privacy? <clears throat> Uh, the organizations that tend to do this with us are the ones that have economic incentives to do so. So where they feel pressure from their buyers to be able to answer questions about security in a sensible manner. And so those are, you know, these are the types of organizations that we're typically working with and those organizations' goals. And so that, again, colors my perspective or shows the place I'm coming from when I look at questions of IoT security. Uh, as we talk about you know, consumers, again, sophisticated consumers might informally threat model, uh, but you know, really they just kind of get what they're going to get. I was talking with my wife uh, not too long ago, and she was uh, you know, asking about deploying one of those personal assistants in our house, and I said, well, just realize that that means that there's going to be something that's listening to everything that we say and sending that out to the cloud. And uh, you know, for, the, for the moment, at least, she thought that might not be appropriate to do in our environment. You know, we'll see how that uh, we'll see how that perception or how that decision evolves over time. And again, consumers really are at the receiving end, and they can rely on the brand that they're dealing with to communicate trust to them. But there aren't a lot of great uh, you know seals of approval or anything out there in the environment right now that allow consumers to make very sophisticated decisions about risk when they're adopting IoT devices. When we look at enterprise and industry, IoT security is largely a supply chain concern. Uh, again, in enterprises, what we see, the majority of deployments are consumer-oriented IoT devices being deployed into their IT infrastructure. Um, you know, we see in industry, uh, again, the more industrial-focused or industrial-centric technologies that are being deployed into these industrial environments. And so it is a supply chain issue. They need to go to their vendors and feel comfortable that what they're getting from their vendors is going to have the appropriate security properties. And so threat modeling for enterprise and industry is valuable for, for a couple of different things. It can, it can help to identify potential risks during the acquisition process. And so by threat modeling these IoT systems, that allows these enterprises, these industries to say, I understand more about how the pieces of this system fit together. I understand its risk profile better. Now I can better understand what that looks like when it arrives in my environment. And similarly, uh, enterprises and, I, and enterprise industry are often in a situation where they have the, the funds or the budget to do assessments, to do third-party reviews of these IoT systems, and so that can identify from a threat model what the potential weaknesses might be to actual vulnerabilities that currently exist in the system. And these enterprises and industry can use that knowledge from a threat model, can use that knowledge from third-party assessments uh, to guide the acquisition process, because they can say, hey, this looks fine, we're happy to put it in our, our environment, they can 
make a decision say, hey, this looks fine, but we're going to have to tweak things uh, in order to get this into our environment safely. They might push back on a vendor and say, we're not going to buy X quantity of whatever you're selling until you address these particular issues. Or they may look at it and say, we can't safely get this into our environment. We don't believe the vendor is in a position to fix that problem. Therefore, we're not going to use these uh, technologies. And so, uh, you know, threat modeling and third-party review of IoT systems are valuable tools. And notice I'm saying during the acquisition process, uh, because that's when you have the greatest leverage. Uh, once you have a contract signed, once you've actually already purchased, certainly as a customer uh, with the organizations that are looking to upsell, that are looking to uh, you know, get follow-on contracts, uh, you know, that, that gives you some leverage, uh, but really your greatest point of leverage is prior to completing that acquisition process. And so you don't want to try to use that leverage during deployment or later on. So for developers, <clears throat> developers can use threat modeling during the development to avoid huge issues in their products. Uh, these can be really expensive to fix and, and obviously embarrassing to have publicly revealed. And so that's one of the things that we've found with the practice of threat modeling. If I look back on organizations we've worked with uh, you know, who we have helped to remediate significant security vulnerabilities, the most expensive vulnerabilities to remediate have all been ones that a, a, even a simple threat model would have identified very early in the process. And so, you know, for developers, threat modeling early has the potential to save a lot of headache and heartache later on. You know, certainly after you've done development, threat modeling can be used to get deeper security insight. It can be used to target internal red team or, you know, external third-party review red teaming activities. Um, <clears throat> You know, but uh, you're, you're better off doing this earlier in the process. And, and, but again, threat modeling for IoT devices early in the process allows organizations to use security as a differentiator for discerning customers, for customers you know, where that is a priority. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the goals of threat modeling. Why do we want a threat model? And I talked about this a little bit just a moment ago. What does this help you do? Threat modeling can help you avoid introducing vulnerabilities to a system while it's in design and development. And it can also be used to help identify vulnerabilities in an existing system. One of the things that I think is often discounted in the value of threat modeling is that it really gives you also the ability to understand the system and to have more durable knowledge of the security state of the system. I'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. So, you know, to avoid introducing vulnerabilities, it's a lot cheaper to identify vulnerabilities on the whiteboard and fix them there than it is to fix them at the keyboard while you're developing, or even worse, after they're out in deployment. So if you think of the IoT systems, uh, there are a lot of devices probably running some type of goofy stripped-down version of Linux. <clears throat> uh, you know, they connect to these you know, web services in a lot of cases, uh, you know, often with a lot of shared infrastructure. And so if you have vulnerabilities in device code, you've got to find a way to get those devices to update reliably. If you have problems in web services and with communications protocols, that may require changes also to all the clients calling into those. And so that, you know, the fact that these vulnerabilities can exist on weird little devices, the fact that these vulnerabilities can exist in the communication of the protocols between systems, those are all characteristics that make them very expensive vulnerabilities to remediate in a lot of cases. And so avoiding introducing vulnerabilities, especially in IoT systems, is a very appropriate and noble goal. And so threat modeling allows teams to proactively identify potential issues and address them during the design phase, which is when that's going to be much less expensive. Threat modeling is also really valuable to find vulnerabilities in existing systems. And so that's one of the things that is a, a challenge if you look at doing assessments of, of any class of applications, but IoT applications especially. You want that to be done in a structured and repeatable way. You know, you, uh, you know, looking at our application security practice, at our testing practice, we want our deliverables to be very consistent. If consultant A does it, it should look very much similar to if consultant B does it. It shouldn't be based simply on the personality or the individual that is working on this. And threat modeling is a way to help homogenize and standardize the assessment process. And we'll talk more specifically about how that can be done. 
but that is something that we have found to be very valuable to provide consistency to this process. So if you have a threat model, you identify the threats, and as part of the testing process, you attempt to identify, it has, that, has this threat been realized in such a way that there's an actual weakness or vulnerability in the system? And finally, understanding the system. And this is something, again, that I feel is overlooked. But a threat model, you know, and specifically the delivery from a threat model, shows architecturally how the parts of the system fit together. And it shows the potential threats or the weaknesses in the system based on that architecture. And, you know, if you, you know, looking at that, you know, that's tremendously valuable, especially as you onboard new developers onto teams, as you bring in new people to bring them up to speed to understand the security state or the security context of the system. If you look at assessments that generate some sort of results and threat modeling that generates a threat model, assessments are, are valuable, but they talk about the security state of the system at a given point in time and for a given configuration. Valuable that that knowledge of that, that, that information is much more transient versus the threat model. System architectures tend to change at a much slower pace, and so a threat model is a much more durable artifact talking about a system. And that's something that I think is really important for teams looking to, you know, especially when they're starting security programs, to understand, you know, do I want to do a threat model? Do I want to do an assessment? Do we have budget to do both? Uh, again, I like threat models because they provide something, this, uh, this you know, knowledge is valuable and durable over time. And I think that's something that um, is, is often overlooked. So why threat model in IoT environments? You know, and so in the good old days, we had users on the outside, security smart, uh, individual security smart developers, uh, application security folks knew, hey, the users are on that side, and we can't trust anything coming into our application from those users. And the really sophisticated folks said, hey, you know what, we probably shouldn't trust stuff coming in from the database as well. But if you think about a lot of web-based applications, back in the good old simple days, the threat models were pretty straightforward and, and, and a lot more consistent for those types of systems than they, than they are now. If we look at moving into a mobile world, all of a sudden things got more complicated because that whole threat model that we had before really gets rolled up into that bubble on the right that says enterprise web services and you know, the data flows coming in and out of that. In a mobile environment, all of a sudden, we've got code running on a device that we don't control that might be malicious. Uh, even if the device isn't malicious, there are other applications installed on the device that might be malicious, uh, potentially trying to impact local store. We may have malicious users using the app, uh, the app on the device. We may be talking out to third-party web services getting data back that we don't know. And we may have attackers that are trying to not use our approved mobile client and instead talk directly to our services. And so. The, you know, we went from playing uh, checkers before in the web app world now to playing chess in the mobile application world. And so the world got more complicated and that makes threat modeling more valuable because understanding the pieces of the system and how they fit together, that helps to identify potential security issues. And as we see system complexity increase, that value of the threat model increases as well because it helps to cut through that complexity in a structured way. Yeah, like, oh crap, now we move to an IoT environment. Well, here we have on the left some sort of an IoT device being used by users that we don't know anything about. Maybe it is talking out through a gateway if that gateway is trying to coordinate locally a number of those devices. Maybe the IoT device needs to talk out to some external web services. And that IoT device probably needs to call back to call back home to some sort of shared IoT support services. Well, those IoT support services also being used potentially by a web client to configure and manage the, the system, uh, also potentially being used by mobile clients to use the system. And so, again, that mobile application threat model gets squished down into a tiny portion of this. And so it's like we're fractally getting more complicated as we advance from web applications to mobile applications to IoT applications. And so now we're playing 3D chess. <clears throat> And again, the value of the threat model increases because it helps us lay out and abstract portions of the system and then to drill in where appropriate so that we can get uh, a better or more focused understanding of the security of the system. 
And so one of the things that I realized as I, as I started looking at IoT security is, is the world really had changed. When we started doing a lot of mobile application assessments a number of years ago, we looked at it and said, well, how can we make, you know, obviously the world has gotten more complicated than with web applications. How can we, is there, is there a structured way that we can look at the world that, that is a valuable starting point for uh, you know, how to understand security and how to advise organizations on security. And so uh, I built a pretty straightforward mobile application threat model that seemed to capture the major things that we saw across mobile application systems. I went through a report of all the uh, vulnerability assessments that we had done, and I was able to identify, well, was this vulnerability in the mobile device? Was it in a supporting web server? Was it a third-party web service? And I also looked at how did we find this? Did we find this with automation or did we find it with manual testing? Did we find it with uh, statically or do we find it dynamically? And in doing so, we were able to figure out, here's how we see the, the distribution that we see of the effectiveness of different techniques for different parts, and here's how we see risk di distributed throughout the system. So you know, something that I was very proud to put together because it put us in a situation where we could have a very structured conversation with organizations to say, I'm going to try to simplify the world for you. Let's look at the resources you have available to apply to mobile security, mobile application security, uh, and based on this, you know, we can make sensible recommendations on where to allocate your efforts. The problem is when I sat down to do this with IoT application assessments, I said, well, let's look at all of the IoT systems that we've looked at. Let's try to create a standard threat model and then went through the same process and said, let's go through all these vulnerability assessments and try to uh, you know, collect that data. Where do we find the problem? Where do the serious problems exist? How do we go about finding those? And so I put together my uh, template IoT threat model. It's the same one that we've looked at a couple times here that is really more of a consumer-oriented uh, uh, you know, IoT threat model. And that worked for a while. I plugged in some, some data and we were collecting some valuable stuff. And then I came across a couple of reports and said, hey, this, I don't really know how to characterize this vulnerability or this weakness that we found. Uh, I went and talked to Cap, who runs our, uh, you know, runs our application security practice. And he said, oh, well, that's because that was, a, that was a, a problem in the enterprise authentication and authorization infrastructure that we identified uh, because they tried to implement this consumer IoT thing. You know, my response was, well, I don't have a box in my threat model to put that in. And he said, well, I guess you need to add a box to your threat model. Had a similar process when we looked, uh, when I looked through some of the industrial IoT assessments that we've done, uh, you know, went to CAP and said, hey, I don't know, you know, you know like this, uh, you know, I, I don't know where to put this vulnerability. And he said, well, that's because you don't have, you know, that, that box doesn't exist in that use case because it's consumer oriented with some enterprise stuff bolted on. This is actually the threat model for that, uh, you know, for, for, for that system that you're talking about. And I said, well, I don't have boxes for that. Said, well, you got to add new boxes. And so uh, as of yet, I still hold out hope that we'll be able to, uh, you know, to, to create uh, more universal templates. And I'll talk later about some resources that are available in support of that. Uh, but, but again, going through this process on something that was, was, was challenging, but ultimately I feel like we were very successful in the mobile space boiling this down into some you know, kind of sensible bite-sized nuggets of knowledge. Uh, you know, IoT systems are so varied and have such different use cases, uh, especially when you look across consumer, enterprise, and industrial environments. Uh, you know, so far, that simplicity has eluded us. So where does that leave us? You know, IoT environments are potentially very complicated and potentially significantly more than what we are used to. And as I've said, that makes threat modeling more valuable and more necessary than ever. If you want to be able to make assertions about the security state or the security characteristics of an IoT system, then it is, I think it's almost required to have at least the architectural breakdown that you would need for an IoT threat model so that you can appropriately characterize. Here are the vulnerabilities and weaknesses we found in the system. You know, in this particular system, here's where they're found. Here's how they could potentially be exploited by different classes of threat actor. In the absence of that, it makes it really challenging to characterize risk in a business-focused way. 
So we'll quickly go through a threat modeling overview. And again, I apologize that we don't have the time to go deeper into uh, a, a, you know, the specifics of threat modeling with more examples. Uh, but I have a link at the end of this slide to some other materials that we have provided on that topic, uh, and, and there's obviously you know, books and other materials out there to, to learn more about it. But from a, from a high level, what you do in threat modeling is you determine the scope. What do I consider to be in the system, out of the system? Uh, you build data flow diagrams, uh, enumerate the threats, and we'll talk about a very mechanical how, way of how to do that, and then make decisions about mitigations. And so. You know, the first thing that we do is we create these data flow diagrams, or Jordan DeMarco uh, style data flow diagrams. And I, I had to laugh when we started doing threat modeling. I remember when I was in undergrad, uh, when we did our capstone software project, the professor used to require us to build Jordan DeMarco style data flow diagrams, because that is what he was used to doing. Uh, and I, of course, because I knew everything, I was you know, 21 years old or something at the time and, and knew everything before I, I got you know, far stupider along to, to, to today. But since I knew everything, I said, you know, hey, Dr. Pitts, uh, you know, why are we doing this in UML? You know, UML is the new cool thing. Nobody, nobody uses this stuff anymore. And uh, Dr. Pitts probably told me to shut up and, and uh, you know, sit down and make my data flow diagrams, which I did. And as it turns out, uh, you know, looking at how these data flow diagrams work. It's a very elegant, a very straightforward and simple way to create the type of architecture diagram that we need for these threat models because you break the system down into different assets. You know, what are the external interactors? What are the things that interact with the system that are outside of the scope of our threat modeling? Uh, what are the processes that are going on to make decisions? Uh, how does data flow between all of those things and where does data get stored? And so breaking the system down into these different assets and how they connect to one another, and also having an understanding of the trust boundaries. Where does data cross trust boundaries? Because that's going to enforce, that's going to require certain decisions to be made from a security standpoint. Uh, so very, very straightforward and easy way to do that. So we see an example data flow diagram here, and we've got a web application in the middle. And again, that's a complex process we may, in another data flow diagram, want to break that up further. But what we see is we've got a user outside the system sending requests, getting responses across this trust boundary. We've got an external web service that we're using, uh, making requests and responses to, again, across the trust boundary. We've got a database storing some information. We're doing reads and writes. Maybe we don't trust the data in the database. Uh, and we are uh, you know, have a one-way data flow where we're also storing application logs. And so a pretty straightforward threat model looking at a web application system that you know, talks to a, a local database as well as to an external service. And so. It's pretty easy to break down into those component pieces. What we then do is identify threats based on the assets. And so, uh, you know, Stride is an expansion of the common CIA threat types, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, Stride is, a, is, a, is an acronym or is a, is a taxonomy uh, developed, I believe, by Microsoft, by the folks with their SDL. Uh, you know, most of this threat modeling that we're talking about today is very similar to the way that the Microsoft folks um, you know, started doing that in their SDL, and so there's the book by, uh, I think, Michael Howard uh, about threat modeling where you can get more information, but Stride expands out CI to look at spoofing identity, <clears throat> you know, tampering with data, uh, repudiation, so uh, the ability of one trading partner to claim to not have participated in a transaction, also information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So very similar to confidentiality, integrity, and availability, but expands that to provide a little bit more granularity. And so based on the asset breakdown that you have in your data flow diagram, you can map threats to different asset types. So for example, an external interactor, they may be uh, able to spoof themselves to the system, and they may be able to act, uh, you know, to repudiate that they participated in a transaction. You know, but you really can't talk about tampering with an external interactor because they're outside of the scope of the system. Uh, similarly, with denial of service, elevation of privilege, uh, because of the role of an external interactor, not something that we're concerned about. Whereas a process, you can do all of these things too, potentially. Looking at data flow, you can tamper with data uh, as it communicates, is communicated between two different assets. Uh, you can also you know, view data or have information disclosure problems, or maybe somebody could deny service, could block that data flow, and that may have an impact on the system. Uh, and similarly, data store you know, has potential all of those problems as well as potential repudiation issues. And so basically by going through 
each of the assets that you've enumerated in your data flow diagram and applying these concerns for each when appropriate, that gives us a master list of the threats to the system. So again, taking all the assets, associating the threat types with each asset, and voila, we've got a list of things that we need to worry about. And that's a fairly mechanical and obviously repeatable way to go through this process. And that's one of the things that I like about threat modeling is that it provides that level of consistency. As long as your architecture diagrams uh, you know, between two systems or between two people that are looking at the systems, as long as your architecture diagrams break down in roughly the same way, that's going to leave you with the same list of uh, associated issues that you need to worry about. And from there, you need to determine countermeasures, right? You can do nothing. That's my favorite countermeasure because I'm a little bit lazy. Um, and and is, in a lot of cases, is an appropriate countermeasure to say we're going to accept the risk. Uh, again, looking at these IoT systems, these IoT uh, you know, uh, devices you can add to environments, they have the ability to potentially enhance, as a consumer, to enhance your life, to let you do things you couldn't do before that are really interesting and valuable. So you're probably willing to accept some risk. Uh, you know, if you're looking at enterprise and, uh, and industrial environments, again, there's tremendous value to be had here. And so you may say, like, hey, a risk of dealing with this system is simply going to be that, we, that this might happen. Uh, but yeah, there's also some more proactive things you can do. Remove a feature, turn off a feature, warn a user, uh, you know, use operations to address the concern, uh, you know, counter the threat with technology. You know, there's no catch-all countermeasure, but basically you can look at the system and say, you know, for example, you know, hey, we have this external interactor that is trying to communicate with this process over these data flows. Well, to avoid problems with the uh, information disclosure or tampering with data across the data flows, we're going to use TLS to protect that traffic. And furthermore, we're going to use, uh, you know, we're, we're going to issue client-side certificates to those external users, and we're going to use that for them to authenticate themselves or to, to help minimize or reduce the risk of spoofing. All right. And so that's an example of using a technical countermeasure that addresses, in this case, a couple of different risks that may have, may have come out of the system. And so if we look at threat modeling, and you know, particularly in IoT environments, again, we've got this example consumer threat model that we can use to enumerate the threats associated with it. And so some specific use cases that we've found issues with is the, the situation of initial provisioning and deployment. When somebody takes this device out of the box and tries to set it up, what are the security risks associated there? How do you know that the person that has the device is the, is the person who's supposed to have the device? How do you know that the device is what it says it is? That's something that is a use case that really needs to be examined. And again, you may come across situations where we say we're just going to accept the risk that someone intercepts a device and is doing something different, or you may say we need to have a much more uh, a more elaborate provisioning and deployment use case in order to allow us to address risks associated with that. You know, similarly looking at configuration updates. How does someone go in and change the behavior of the system? Are they going to go in via a mobile app or a web app? And then those configuration changes need to be pushed down to individual, you know, one or more individual devices. Uh, that's an important use case to look through because that's one where we found a number of problems. Uh, you know, also, how do you integrate these devices and these systems into enterprise authentication and authorization infrastructure? Some, you know, some devices are really good at that, others are more challenging, and so you have to look at concerns about, well, you know, what, what sort of network segmentation do I need to put around these devices, and how, uh, you know, how am I going to let them represent themselves to other parts of our IT infrastructure? Uh, similarly, software updates. How, when I inevitably need to make changes to these web services or, and more scary, to these individual devices that we have strewn all over the place, how am I going to do software updates? And those could be software updates for new features, bug fixes, uh, but they also may be security fixes. And so to look to see how are we going to securely be able to update these devices and to be able to do that reliably as well. So I know that that can happen on some, side of a, some sort of a sensible time frame. You can use threat models to help scope assessments. And as we've talked about, IoT systems have many different parts and they have different kinds of parts. 
So if we look at that, uh, you know, if, if we look at that you know, sample consumer threat model, there's a web application, there's web services, there's custom hardware running, you know, potentially weird esoteric protocols, and so there's a lot more stuff going on in this complicated environment. And so creating a test plan can be challenging, and you're never going to have the resources to be exhaustive. And so what we found is that threat modeling can help drive decisions about the trade-offs. So if you're looking at an IoT system and saying, well, I have X amount of resources that I can devote to testing, do I want to fuzz test the Zigbee stack on that device, or do I want to run SAST on the web services? Where am I going to get the most value for the testing resources that I have available? Obviously, in a perfect world, you would say we're going to be exhausted, we're going to look at all these things. From a practical standpoint, you've got to look at the capabilities that you can bring to bear and the level of resources that you have at your disposal, and that is going to focus in those testing activities. It's going to force you to make tough choices, but again, the threat model has enumerated these challenges for you, or the different parts for you, and that allows you to, at least when you're making challenging or difficult decisions, it allows you to make those in a better, or from a better and informed perspective. Another thing that has been really interesting that we've seen in working with these IoT systems is safety concerns. Uh, and I'm going to create something that, uh, that Joshua Corman mentioned to me uh, that really summed up uh, how, how this is different. This is something that we had, had always viewed as different and always looked at safety concerns. But in the conversation, you know, you know, he said, in, you know, in, in, I'm paraphrasing, uh, in a typical security environment, you're concerned about confidentiality breaches of regulated information. Oh no, someone got our credit cards. Oh no, someone got our PII. Oh no, someone got our health information. And that's obviously bad. But in an IoT environment, especially as you start to look to industrial applications of IoT, all of a sudden you now have greater concerns about integrity or availability breaches uh, that impact the kinetic environment. <clears throat> and so, Again, folks looking at confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it's not new to have integrity and availability as a concern, but if you look at where the vast majority of the thinking has been prior to kinetically attached IoT devices, the focus has very much been on confidentiality. Um, and, and again, if you, if you look at what gets reported in the press, all of these data breaches, that is, you know, that is the overarching concern. And with IoT, that really force you also to ask some really tough questions about integrity and availability, saying, wait a minute, what if this telemetry data is modified? Can that make the system do something weird that might impact somebody? What if I can take down this gateway since this system is denied of information? How is the end device or the edge, how are the edge devices going to operate in an environment where they're starved of that information? And so that's something that is really important. And so, uh, you know, if you think, I don't know if anybody out there is a, or Stephen King fans, there's a, the Mangler, which was uh, based on a Stephen King short story where a, a piece of industrial laundry equipment gets possessed by the devil. Uh, that's obviously bad. There's uh, the, well, the, the movie, uh, I, I, I hesitate to call it a film, but the movie uh, Maximum Overdrive based on another Stephen King short story of trucks where a comet goes by the earth a little bit too close and the radiation makes all the trucks on, on earth come alive. Um, you know, those are both scary stories, but the really scary stories that are potentially being written right now are being written by developers where you take industrial laundry equipment and you take trucks and you attach them to the internet without proper safety safeguards. Uh, so again, it's a good thing that Stephen King made his money because I think the true scary stories in the IoT age are being written by developers that aren't thinking properly, aren't thinking enough about the security of the systems that they're building. So that's a concern that we have in an IoT environment that we haven't had, certainly not to this degree prior. Uh, also, medical device risk. Uh, you know, when uh, Vice President Dick Cheney was having his uh, pacemaker implanted, they turned off some remote access capabilities that are typically in there for uh, convenience purposes. But the threat model for uh, a vice president is such that you may be more concerned that a nation state would use that as a potential attack vector for an assassination attempt. And so, you know, making the determination, hey, we're going to we're going to turn off certain capabilities of this device. You know, because of this particular threat model, this particular risk scenario. Similarly, uh, for folks that have followed along with some of the research that has been presented in Black Hat and elsewhere on these uh, insulin pumps. <clears throat> if we look at medical devices, if we look at connected vehicles, you know, all of these things 
start to have an impact on the kinetic world that we simply didn't have before when we were playing Angry Birds on our phones. Uh, and here's some links. Uh, again, I've, I've mentioned that I cribbed some of this from uh, Josh Corman and the We Are the Cavalry folks. These are some links uh, that talk about these issues and I think uh, a way that is very succinct and sensible. Um, just as we wrap it up here, uh, one of the really uh, very, very interesting thing that I saw recently is that the ARM folks, the ARM processor folks, have released uh, on their platform security architecture resources three threat model templates uh, looking at asset and asset tracking uh, use case for IoT, a smart water meter, as well as a network attached camera. And these are threat models that look, and they're very focused on the threat model, like very focused on the device itself. Uh, as you would expect from the folks making the, the, the processor for the device. Uh, but I think that is really cool to see vendors start to release guidance in threat model form on how their products can safely be used and safely be integrated into different environments. The methodology they use is a little bit different than ours, but, it, uh, but again, I think this is a tremendous resource and something that is really valuable to see coming out of the industry to see vendors of products start to say, hey, this is how the security of this system works. You can use this as a resource to better understand how these products are going to fit into your environments and your applications. Uh, I talked earlier about some more threat modeling materials that are available. That's a link to some slides that go more in depth in the threat modeling process. And so we were only able to, from a technical, from an implementation uh, standpoint, we didn't have a lot of time today to go deep into the weeds on that. And so I wanted to provide these as an additional resource for folks who want to get deeper into this. And just as, as a, from closing or for closing thoughts, uh, you know, IoT systems are very and complicated, which is cool. You know, just like mobile applications allowed folks to do, you know, businesses and individuals to do things they couldn't do before, we're similarly seeing that type of an increase in capability, that type of an opportunity to innovate, which is great. The problem is IoT brings a tremendous amount of complexity, and that complexity is, is increasingly tied up in systems that potentially have safety implications. So threat modeling is a, a valuable technique both for avoiding introducing vulnerabilities as you're designing and building systems, as well as for structuring the assessments that you use or the reviews that you use in order to find vulnerabilities. And so if you're, if you're an organization that are, you're considering building or deploying significant IoT systems, you can save yourself a lot of headaches up front through the use of threat modeling. Again, it's a technique that is uh, something that we've found only increases in value over time as the systems organizations are deploying have moved from web-centric to mobile-centric and now to IoT-centric. Now we'll open the floor up for questions. Okay, so the first question here is, uh, you know, th threat modeling, you know, what's the, uh, what, what, what's the biggest difference between threat modeling mobile versus IoT? So I, I touched on this a little bit, uh, but again, I, what I think you see in the difference, or the differences that, that I've found is we were able to survey a number of mobile systems and use that in order to, uh, you know, to to build a template threat model that wasn't obviously comprehensive for every case that we saw, but acted as a very good starting point. In the IoT space, the architectures of these systems is just so different because they're being used for so many different things, just the variability of devices, the you know, variety of connection patterns and all that, uh, that has made it challenging to provide guidance that was as succinct, and, and as a result, it is, uh, you know, even more challenging with, with mobile application security and testing. You can say, well, hey, here's kind of your template threat model, and here are the decisions that naturally flow from that. It's hard to be that consistently prescriptive um, or, or prescriptive in a way that is so consistent across environments in the IoT space. Just the complexity has been, uh, you know, the, the complexity is, is much more uh, significant. Uh, we also see here is, uh, you know, when's the best time during the life cycle to start? Uh, I think that informal threat modeling, uh, you can start, again, as soon as, uh, you know, as, as soon as anyone is ready to do so. <clears throat> uh, 
you know, around whiteboards and starting discussions and things like that, uh, you probably want to be, you know, by the time that you're, before you start doing a formal threat model where you're looking to capture the, you know, capture those results in some sort of a durable format, you probably want to be, uh, you know, reasonably well into the architecture and starting to talk about design. That's when you're going to know enough about how the parts of the system are going to be laid out, how they're going to fit together, um, such that you can start to make that threat model. And again, a threat model is a living document. It's going to evolve over time as the system gets new capabilities. Uh, but as I also mentioned earlier, the rate of change of the threat model, just because the rate of change of the architecture uh, is hopefully going to be slower, the rate of change for the threat model is also uh, hopefully going to be slower. But, that, but we do view those as a living document that, uh, uh, they're a living document that is going to evolve over time. Uh, next, uh, is there a risk focusing on data resources when threat modeling? It seems operational continuity gets shortchanged. Yeah, th that is that is a great uh, that that is a great question. And so, data resources are obviously important. Uh, again, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, and and but I think a pitfall that we see for a lot of security practitioners that are they're very used to being focused on data and focused on data confidentiality. Uh, you know, I, I think you make a great point that, the, that, that you need to make sure to take a step back and widen the aperture, uh, especially, from a you know, especially from a standpoint of safety, but just in general, looking at how these systems are distributed throughout the physical world and have you know, physical presence, even if, you know, even if I'm not worried about my, uh, uh, you know, about my camera you know, coming to life and shooting me with lasers or something like that. You know, so even if there's not necessarily a direct safety risk associated with that, I think definitely in an IoT environment, taking a step back to focus on the operational continuity, uh, availability, as you mentioned in your question here, um, you know, as well as integrity, uh, I think those have increased value in an IoT environment. Next question, how do you advise organizations involved with IoT development and managing the trade-off between users' privacy versus convenience? Uh, have we investigated ways to expose in a clear and understandable manner what data is actually collected by the device? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's certainly a very uh, important and timely question. Uh, the Facebook folks have been in a situation where they're certainly answering a lot more questions about this from a social media standpoint. Um, and so I see that security, from, from a privacy standpoint, the foundation is security, uh, especially when you're looking at data confidentiality, is you, know, you have to have a system that has the appropriate security properties such that the system can't be made to leak data. Uh, and then after that, it's a question, you know, the, a lot of those privacy decisions are then made by the system designers and developers because they've got to make a determination of what information are we going to collect. And I think that's something where transparency has a, uh, has, has a lot of value and that may, and, and that is something that I think is going to become uh, an, an increasing priority. Understanding, hey, I have this thing sitting in my room and it's recording everything I do to try and do some sort of, sort of speech monitor. I have this camera that turns on at certain times. How much of that data stays here? How much of it is communicated? Right now, that's a little bit of a black box with these systems. Um, you know, I think that it is something that increasingly um, openness about those types of issues and those types of communications uh, those are going to be you know, initially potentially a differentiator for certain vendors of IoT devices and IoT systems, but as those are placed in even more invasive uh, vantage points, uh, I think that's going to be more of a requirement across the industry. And I think um, you know, both from a privacy communication standpoint as well as from a, a security communication standpoint, I think that is um, before we get to any sort of uh, you know, gold, gold star or like external third-party review standard or something like that. I think the, the first step on that road is more openness on the creators and the vendors of these IoT systems about both the security properties as well as the privacy properties. Uh, okay, next question is, does your threat modeling exercise help developers manage the actual collection of data versus what data privacy policies the state will be, co uh, will be collected? Uh, you know, that is something that we typically do on a case-by-case -case basis. Some organizations, uh, that is a priority for them. 
to say, you know, we have made certain assertions about the privacy characteristics of our, uh, you know, of this, of this device or of this system. Uh, therefore, we need to make that a priority. Um, you know, that is, that is not universal. And so it is certainly something we have helped organizations with. Uh, some organizations are more concerned about that than others. And so, uh, you know, I would say that all organizations looking at IoT threat modeling are concerned about the security of the system, and a subset of those are also concerned about the privacy uh, and want to make sure that the, the, the both the policy side of the house uh, or that the policy side of the house matches with the technical implementation. All right, I think that is all the questions that we have for today. Well, great. Well, thank all of you for attending. Uh, really appreciate, uh, really appreciate everybody that, uh, that tuned in today. Uh, for colleagues that may not have had the opportunity to do that, we will shortly be posting the slides and a recording of this presentation. Again, appreciate you guys sharing some of your time with us today. Appreciate the questions. Uh, those are, are, are great and I think provide tremendous insight. And I hope you all have a great rest of the day and uh, be safe out there.